I'd like to welcome you to our Willow Creek Association webcast. We do these webcasts each month to continue to encourage your leadership development throughout the year. We also want to engage with you, want it to be a conversation. So along the way, answer the polls so that we can all get to know each other better and go ahead and participate in the chat as well. If you do that, a few of you could win a copy of our guest book. Later in the broadcast, we will be bringing your questions from the chat right into the discussion. Now today, we welcome consultant and author Liz Wiseman. She's the president of the Wiseman Group, a leadership research and development center headquartered in Silicon Valley, where she advises senior executives on leadership strategy and team building. Formerly, she was the vice president at Oracle Corporation, responsible for developing globally minded leaders through their leadership training center, Oracle University. Liz is the author of Multipliers, a book that's getting a lot of buzz in the business community these days. Multipliers is based on years of research into the types of leaders who lead highly effective teams. It provides an insightful and practical perspective, one that I think you will find highly applicable to your leadership. Let me frame it up to you. We've all had experience with two dramatically different types of leaders. Some leaders, possibly unintentionally, are difficult to work with. They drain energy and capabilities from their teams, always needing to be the smartest one in the room. Liz calls these leaders diminishers. Now, by contrast, we've all probably worked with leaders who brought out the best on their teams. And these leaders skillfully amplify the intelligence and capability of the people they work with. She calls these leaders multipliers. And Liz has done extensive research into both of these kinds of leaders. She's identified specific characteristics that makes the multiplier leader so effective. And the best news is that you and I can develop these skills and apply them to our own leadership. I'd also like to introduce you to Steve Gillen, who will interview Liz. Steve is the pastor at Willow Creek Community Church's North Shore campus. And over the past decade that I've known Steve, I've observed him as one of those multiplying leaders as he's built teams and developed leaders in Willow's 20-something ministry and now at North Shore. I thought he'd be the perfect person to talk with Liz and help us dig into this leadership concept. So let me turn it over to you now, Steve. Well, welcome everyone. Welcome, Liz. Thank you, Steve. I want to start our conversation uh, into this book on what led you to the writing of this? What were, were the events either at your business or in your consulting that caused you to investigate this issue? Well, it started really early in my experience, my career. I worked at Oracle and I ran the corporate university there, which meant I sat on the management team for the company and I got to work with a lot of executives. And I noticed that although all of them were brilliant, not all of them had this effect on others where other people around them were brilliant. I noticed some of them had this way of of dumbing down yeah. the people around them. Somehow for them to be the smartest person in the room, other people couldn't yeah. be. And I saw people hold back. But around other leaders, those very same people, same IQ, same capability around another leader, they're brilliant. And why is that? Um, and when I left Oracle, I just, it was this kind of little lingering observation. I started doing some executive coaching and I could see this with other leaders. And so it kind of turned into a curiosity until one day I was talking with a leader about, about this contagious viral effect some leaders had. And he goes, oh, they're, they're amplifiers. And that led to, they become multipliers to the intelligence of others. And then it turned into a total obsession. I have to research to really get to the bottom of this and find out why they get so much more out of people. Yeah, yeah your group uh, put together a fantastic video to introduce the concept. And we'd like to share that video with you, especially for those of you who haven't read the book. This will give you an idea of this idea of a multiplier and a diminisher. So watch us out and we'll continue the conversation on the back end. What is the fate of the smart and the talented? The corporate world finds smart, talented people and promotes them into management. But many of these leaders never look beyond their own capability to see the full genius on their team. Have you ever worked around someone who made you feel smarter and more capable? We call these leaders multipliers. Have you ever worked around someone who made you question your own intelligence? We call these leaders diminishers. They may hire smart people, but they quickly put other people in the background. They are smart leaders, but they shut down the smarts of others. Diminishers come at such a high cost, they waste talent and intellect that sits right in front of them. 
organizations can't afford diminishers. Multipliers come from all walks of life, from corporate boardrooms to our school's classrooms. They are leaders like Lut Ziab, Bill Campbell, Wangari Mathai, and many more. These people are real, and the way they lead can be learned and it can be developed. What would happen in your organization if you operated more like a multiplier? Imagine what is possible with access to all the intelligence that sits in your organization. So that video did a great job introducing this concept, two different kinds of leaders, diminishers and multipliers. Uh, talk to me a little bit more about diminishers. What, what did you find in this type of leader who diminishes others? Well, you know, fundamentally, they're, they're smart leaders, and they're valuable to organizations because they're so smart, but they're, they often don't grow smarts around them. And, you know, uh, sometimes they have a very elite view of intelligence. That there's a few smart people in the organization. Those people should be in charge on top of the organization, and they should do the thinking for the organization. And, you know, um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with an executive, a large company, I was attending his staff meeting. He had about 25 of his management team around the table, kind of working on an important issue. We walk out of the meeting, and he says to me, just kind of off the cuff, he said, you know, in these meetings, there's only really one or two people I ever listen to. Yeah. And he goes, there's only one or two people that have the good ideas. Everyone else I kind of ignore. And I looked at him kind of in horror, and he, and he says, well, Liz, of course, you're one of those right. people. And I'm like, I don't think I am. <laughs> But what was horrifying to me is he led a team of 4,000 people. Wow. And there was only one or two people worth listening to. Yeah. So that's kind of this diminisher mindset at its, at its extreme. Yeah. Certain amount of people are worth listening to. They're smart. They're capable. But it also comes up in very subtle ways as we just assume that our job is to, uh, as a leader is to have the answers, direct, set the standard. Um, you know, And it reminds me on the most subtle end of a women's minister who just who took over, wanted to kind of raise the quality of, of the work and the service and, and of the ministry. And so she set the standard, set the pace. Pretty soon the events looked great and great things were happening, but her team of volunteers wasn't able to keep up with her. Yeah. And it got to the point where one of them, you know, resigned and, yeah. and said, you know what? She said she was busy, but really in private, what she said to people is, I just can't keep up and I really don't feel useful here. You know, I'm somehow exhausted, but underutilized. And I think that's what it looks like in its most subtle form. Yeah, that's one of the key components you talked about, that if you're working for a diminisher at the core of it, you're getting less than that person's best intelligence, best engagement. Uh, they're just not fully present because the leader doesn't value them, correct? It is. And, you know, what I found in all this research is that people, you know, it's so clear to me, people come to work wanting to contribute everything. Um, you know, people want to be smart. You know, we work for, for intellectual stimulation. And what we find is that they encounter this barrier where they, they have the skill, they have the smarts, but they don't have a, a boss or a leader who knows how to receive it. And they end up giving kind of a fraction of their capability yeah, yeah. to diminishers. Yeah. I know in other situations, you've done kind of a fun poll to listen to people about their experience with diminishers. And so we'd like to actually give that opportunity now uh, to those of you uh, watching, taking part in this. Uh, and do you want to set this up, Liz, how you want to do this poll? Sure. It, 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 two simple questions. First of all, you know, let me ask you to think about someone who is a diminisher to you. It could be someone in your current work. It could be somewhere, anywhere from your career. And what I mean by diminisher is, is someone that was smart and surrounded with smart people, but hard, complex problems didn't get solved. The work didn't move forward at the pace you would expect. And then I've got two questions for you. Once you've kind of locked one person in your mind, and for some of us, you know, our mind is flooded with numerous people, what did that person do? We'll start with that question. What could you observe in their behavior? Chat that in. We'll take a look at this and we'll see if we can very rapidly sum yeah. this up and see what's common across these diminishers. So let's start with what did they do? Yep, so if you can, in the chat function, uh, type in what your diminisher did and then if you see on the side, you're going to see that there's a poll there. And the question is, that person, that diminisher, 
how much intelligence did they, did they get from you? If, if you were just going to take uh, your best educated guess, as far as this is the percentage I would say they give, just type that in. It'll give us a chance to respond, but to see from you exactly what is your experience and see if it matches with what you've seen with other people. Yeah, and you know, Steve, it's a tricky question because we're not asking how hard you were working. Yeah. We're asking how much of your intelligence, your, your ideas, your insights, you know, your God-given talent, yeah. your creativity, how much of that was this person able to get from you? It's very different than how hard you're working. Yeah. You know, we find that people can be extremely busy, but intellectually bored. Yeah. You know, that often we're overworked, but underutilized at the exact same time, we're, you know, we're knocking ourselves out. Yep. You had a great phrase for this in the book where you, you, you described people who who worked for a diminisher as, the, it was kind of a zombie metaphor, the walking dead, they wander the halls and you can see their best is not coming out. And you had a phrase, I wrote down, that these people many times make the decision to quit and stay. Talk, talk to me about that. I think our organizations in the business world, in the nonprofit world, you know, even in the church, they're full of people who, who have given up. They've tried, they've tried to contribute, they've yeah. tried to be innovative, they've tried to be proactive, and they come up against a wall and they decide to quit and stay. Yeah. And they're, they're dangerous. The people who quit, you know, they create a retention problem and a turnover problem, but the people who quit and stay create this morale problem because, you know, this underutilization, it's, inf it's infectious. Yeah. And it's also really damaging to people emotionally and physically. Yeah, there's a toxicity to it for a culture mm -hmm. that we intuitively know who these people are, what's happened, and, and it rubs off on others, doesn't it? Yeah, and you know, it's interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see what this poll comes up with. What we find is that people describe this experience working for diminishers yeah. as exhausting. Yeah as exhausting, but yet they're only giving, what does it say on our poll? Yeah, so the poll, if you look at it, you go uh, about 37% say they got about 40% of my intelligence. Very few, if any, uh, said 100%. Very few, most of these people said 60% or less. And you can see in the chat, the things the diminishers did, they said they gave busy work, it was exhausting. Uh, they were control oriented, they were micromanaging, they didn't listen. It was always about them. They felt marginalized, uninvolved. Is this what you typically hear? You know, it, it's very consistent. What you see is some very common behaviors that we see, but you see some of the, the, the orientation in the mindset. The yeah. diminisher mindset is, no one's gonna figure this out without me. Yeah. And they tend to orient towards themselves. And it's, it's a strange numbers game. Often they'll have eight to 10 people working for them, but their focus is on themselves. Yeah. Whereas you see the multiplier shift their focus onto the team. and. You know, Steve, don't you think it's interesting that, you know, here we've got what, let's call that sort of 40%, that maybe the average yeah. might even be a little lower, let's call that 38, that giving 38% of our capability is exhausting. Yeah, yep. You know, you think, well, that's easy, people are kicking back. No, it's an exhausting experience for people. Yeah, well, even if you just go, uh, and these are talented people, only 6% or so said that they got 80% or better. I mean, that's a huge percentage that says, I'm not even near my best because of the leadership I'm getting. Yeah, and if we took, if we took another poll and said, what percentage of your capability were you attempting to give? Yeah. Oh, I, we don't even need that poll. I can tell you from talking to people, that number looks really close to 100%. Yeah. So it's this gap between what we have, our capability, what we come into work every day wanting to do, and then this wall we bounce off of, and this we end up with this latent intelligence yep. inside of our organizations, more intelligence than we're using. And I just think we've got some big challenges and problems in the world, but yet we have the intelligence inside of our organizations. Yeah. You know, how do we get at that? That's really where the multiplier comes in. Yeah, all right, so let's transition then to the multiplier. How would you describe the multiplier? Uh, how, how would you describe what they do and how they get the best from their people? You know, the multiplier is someone whose orientation is out, it's on their team, they use their intelligence to bring out intelligence in people around them. They're amplifiers mm. of the intelligence of others. And you know, I think they're leaders who understand that it's great to be the genius, but sort of at the notch higher on the intelligence hierarchy, if you will, is the genius maker. Yeah. And that's what they do. They create an army of smart, capable people. So they see this strength in numbers. Yeah, well, uh, you're already talking about, so we wanna lead you as well to both the chat and the poll on this one, to say what did your multiplier, if you had someone in your life who's been that role for you, what did they do? What were the qualities that they brought to the table for your leadership? 
And then also, what amount of intelligence did they get out of you on the chat side, if, or on the poll side? If you could just type that in as well, and we'll respond to that in a second. Uh, Talk to me, though, about in your life, the multipliers you've experienced. What were a couple of things they did that got the best out of you? Well, you know, my, my multipliers are people who gave me jobs that were too big for me. Hmm. And, you know, I was 24 years old when I had just a year out of business school. I was working and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, Liz, you're now running the training department. By the way, we need a corporate university. Larry Ellison wants one. Go build it. You know, I'm thinking you know, aren't there any adults who can do this job? Because, you know, I, I am a child. I don't know how to do this. I've never done it before. But essentially, I had bosses who gave me jobs the way that you would shop for shoes for your children. Yeah. You know, how, how do you buy? You've got young children, I Steve, do. eight yeah. and five. How do you size those shoes? Uh, uh I'm going to tell you first, my wife probably sizes the shoes more than I do, but <laughs> typically they set up and they go, your feet are going to grow, so we're going to plan for the growth of your feet, and, uh, and that's what we're always thinking about, is a shoe size bigger than where you are today. And that's kind of what my multipliers did. They supersized me. They gave me this job that was too big, and when I was saying, like, but daddy, my feet are flopping around yeah. in these shoes, it's like, don't worry, you're going to grow into it. Yep. And so for me, my multipliers challenged me. They asked me to do really, really hard things. They weren't always the nice, feel-good leaders, but they were leaders who expected an extraordinary amount out of me. Yeah, yeah. All right, so we're already getting some of the answers here. And uh, if you look at the poll, it's dramatically different uh, from where we saw the first one. This one, you're, you're looking at 56% saying 100%. These people are getting their very best. Very few or less than 60%. This is well typical of what you see? You know, it is typical of what we see. And, you know, what, what we've got here, probably an average like in the 90, yeah. you know, 90%, maybe low 90s if you wait out all that data. And, and the kinds of things we see here, you know, they, they stretched me. They gave me accountability. They instilled confidence in me. Um, it's very much what we see. We find that there's an interesting duality inside of the multipliers. It's not just diminish or bad, multiplier good. Right. Um, the multiplier way of leading is not a soft way of leading. They're not just yep. cheerleaders, yep. you know, support, encourage, trust, yes, but that's not the end of the story. Okay. These are leaders that have high expectations, that challenge, that hold you accountable. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways that we can end up diminishing people is by releasing them of their accountability. Oh, you tried hard, it's okay. It's not how we learn and grow. Yeah. You know, we grow when we're held accountable to reasonably high expectations. Yeah, so these aren't just nice, gentle, soft, cupcake kind of leaders. <laughs> no, there's no, really there's no cupcakes. strong. There's no cupcakes. And, yeah. and they're leaders, um, it's interesting, people described working for these leaders, often with a hard edge, hmm. these leaders with a hard edge, but when they talked about it, and it was so thrilling to interview people and have them talk about it, they, they almost, oozed, a kind of a love. Love is the only word I could really come up with to describe how they felt. They loved working for these leaders yeah. because they gave them space, they backed away, and then they let them be brilliant. And who doesn't want to work for someone who lets you be brilliant and uses all of your intellect and capabilities? Yeah. yeah so on the chat, what some of you are saying is they gave authority, they believed in me, they encouraged me, there was accountability. So they're saying the same thing you're feeling, which is, they didn't let me off the hook, they pushed me. They let me make mistakes, but they gave me big jobs that stretched me. Uh, and then they hit on one that we're gonna talk about in a minute, but they listened to me. And there's a power in listening that you found in these multipliers, isn't there? They is, they're, they're extraordinary listeners, but you know, Steve, they don't listen in the way that a lot of us have been taught to listen, this kind of active learning of, yeah. oh, that's interesting, you know, how do you feel about that? Um, so what I hear you saying is, is they don't listen like this. They listen to learn. You know, it's a very different way of, of listening. They're, they're wanting to soak information and knowledge out of people. They're actually genuinely interested in what other people have to say. It comes from their fundamental orientation, yeah. one of curiosity. Yeah. The diminisher you already talked about, they felt like they're the smartest people in the room and no one else can do what they can do, right? There's kind of a scarcity mindset that there aren't enough smart people in the world and so they've got to take the lead and the multiplier is quite the opposite, right? The multiplier mindset is really one of their smart people everywhere and it's not to say, it's not Pollyanna, it's not that, you know, everyone is brilliant, everyone has brilliance, yes. everyone has intelligence and capability and even if that intelligence looks maybe 
more like a skyline of buildings than a horizon. Yeah. You know, it recognizes that people are at different levels, but everyone can grow. So intelligence exists in the universe in, the, in an abundance, and it be, can be accessed, it can be stretched, and it can be grown. Yeah, yeah one of the quotes I like down here, somebody said, they supersized me. <laughs> and that's a real sense. You go, here's where I was, this person challenged me, and I did more than I thought I could accomplish. And it can feel a little scary in the mm -hmm. process. You know, we all know that feeling when you go home from work or someone, or church, and someone's just giving you a big responsibility and a task, and you're thinking, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. It creates this gap that you either crumble or you kind of let go of the stretch or you have to lean into. And yeah. that's what they do is they give people just enough stretch that you, you, you lean in, you learn, you figure out how to do it. You build capability, you build talent, and then they're waiting there to give you the next stretch. Right. So when you study this, you identify these two different groups, you give language to it. You then develop the archetypes of what these two different groups of people do. Do you want to talk us through what a diminisher does? Yeah, yeah, you know, driven by this mindset that, you know, people aren't going to figure it out without me, you know, it leads them to, you know, a certain set of behaviors. A lot of what they do is alike, what diminishers and multipliers do. What, what we were looking for is, what do they do differently? Mm -hmm. And it starts with how they manage talent. Um, you know, the, the diminisher tends to be an empire builder. They love to hire smart people. And they do often hire really brilliant people people, but A players become B players, right. become C. And the metaphor or the visual I always get with this is kind of, you know, grandma's curio cabinet. We all have a grandma with a curio cabinet with like lots of little pretty knickknacks all behind glass, but not well used. And that's kind of how they use talent. They surround themselves with talent, but it's not well used. Um, they also tend to be tyrants and they're not the yeller chair throwing kind of tyrants. It's typically just a very subtle anxiety, just enough anxiety that, you know, triggers that response where the amygdala takes over, fight or flight, we all know about that, but it's the part of the brain that stops working that's interesting, the neocortex, where we do all of our critical thinking, our logic, our trade-offs. I mean, we, we physiologically get stupid when we experience this kind of stress. Um, they tend to be know-it-alls. They set direction based on what they know, what they see. The problem that lies in that is they rarely ask people to do things they don't know how to do. You know, if they've never grown an organization, they don't ask other people to do it. You know, if they've never solved that problem, they don't ask. Um, when it comes to important decisions, they tend to be decision makers. They make fast decisions. And it's a little deceptive because they're smart and they make good decisions. But they make decisions other people don't understand because they haven't had a chance to, to weigh in. So they end up spending their time trying to run around getting buy-in for decisions that have already been made, which I think is a colossal waste of time. Um, and they tend to micromanage, and we, we don't really need to go into detail of right. what that looks like. Right. We've all been micromanaged <laughs> some point, and so we know exactly what that looks like. Um, On the decision maker, is it also that they make decisions that that would be a development opportunity for the people in their organization to grow if they just handed that decision or, or, or the potential to dialogue on the decision at least, that it would grow their intelligence as well. Is that a piece of that concept? It is. And, you know, what we, we don't find that multipliers are consensus decision makers. It's not like these leaders turn decisions over to other people. Often they are, they're the leader, they're yeah. accountable, they make the decision. What people want is not to snatch that decision away from their boss. What they want is exactly what you said. I want to dialogue about it. I want to weigh in. Yeah. I really want to weigh in on this decision. I'm happy with you making it, but I want to surface the problems, the yeah. pitfalls, yeah. as well as the possibilities behind this. Well, in the process, you train your people to become decision makers as well. It's a skill to develop. Oh, so. one, of, one of my favorite um, multipliers, Lutz Ziab, he has this practice. I mean, he's a brilliant, brilliant debate maker. Um, I, I write about him quite often in the book, but they have this theater I was up at uh, Microsoft where he, he leads the learning organization and they said, oh, we make a lot of our decisions in the theater. Huh. I'm like, oh, the theater, can I see the theater? <laughs> they walk me down to this theater, which is you know, a big room. It's got a conference table around the middle, just like all conferences, chairs sitting around. They said, when it comes time for our debates, you know, if you're gonna participate in the debate, you sit around the chairs at the table. I said, well, okay, what are all these chairs lined up around the perimeter of the room? And they said, oh, those are for the people to observe. 
They said, we invite anyone to come into our debates, anyone who's got a stake in this issue, and they can sit around the perimeter. They don't engage in the debate. But think about what happens. It. Yeah. it creates transparency. It educates them. Yeah. They're getting ready to execute. And they go on to say, when those people are invited to the table to debate, yeah. they know how to do it. Exactly. They've been taught you know, how to really weigh in on an issue. Yeah. All right. So let's flip to what are the skills of the multiplier? What are the things in that archetype that you've seen? Yeah, what we find is they start with this assumption that people are smart and are going to figure it out. I mean, it sounds like a, a very simple idea, but it's a sort of radical belief yeah. that, you know, around you are people who will figure this out. You know, they may skin their knees in the process, but but they will. The way they manage talent, they're talent magnets. They identify people's native genius. You know, mm -hmm. the thing that we just do easily and freely. And then they put it to work at its highest point of contribution, at its fullest. And because of that, people flock to work for them. Yeah. You know, we all want to work with someone who uses us at our genius. Um, you know, they're, they're liberators. They, they create an environment where people can do their best thinking and their best work. And in many ways, that is an environment of space. I'm going to give you space to think, and then what do I get in exchange for that space? You know, I want your very best thinking. Um, they're, they're challengers. They ask people to do hard things. They make people uncomfortable. They don't necessarily delight in it, but they know that they can't grow an organization or grow the people inside it unless they give them a little bit of an uncomfortable stretch. They stretch that rubber band and then they just hold there and they let the other person come toward them. Yeah, they don't rescue them. They, they enjoy the tension knowing that's where the growth happens. And you know, and Steve, we find that a lot of really nice people sometimes have a hard time being multipliers because we wanna, we wanna rescue and say, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, and then they tend to be debate makers. We talked about this. We talked mm -hmm. about Lutz Ziab. Um, they let people weigh in on important decisions. And because they do, they have all the buy-in they need. Mm -hmm. You know, because we buy into decisions, not necessarily that we agree with, but decisions that have been prosecuted and pursued. Uh, and then we find their investors, they give ownership to other people. It's like um, one, one multiplier we looked at, he was hiring a vice president and he said, Doug, when it comes to this part of the business, you get 51% of the vote, I'll hold 49. I mean, how do you operate when your boss just said, you, you're in charge? Yeah. He says, and I get 51% of the vote, 49% I'll hold, and you get 100% of the accountability mm -hmm. that goes with that, that privilege. Yeah. And we find that they get very, very different results. Um, it's pretty consistent with what we saw here in the poll, but we found diminishers get less than half of people's capability. 48% is what we found in our early rounds of research, and uh, 90, you know, 5 to 97% for multipliers. Multiplier. Very, very, like a 2x difference. Not 20% more, twice. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I just got to ask, is, are these skills that you're born with, or have you seen people uh, progress towards the multiplier through through hard work, coaching? Uh, is this just something I am one or the other, or I can become a multiplier? You know, I think we, we do have some natural orientations. Probably a lot of it has to do with how we were led, yeah. maybe how we were raised. But I have seen some people who I might call the accidental diminisher. Mm -hmm. You know, the really good person, good manager, who's, who doesn't realize they're having a diminishing effect. I've seen them you know, go down the path of multiplier, yeah. often by just a quick awareness. Yeah. And then I've seen some people who would probably call themselves hardened diminishers. You know, I get a lot of people who read the book and say, Liz, I'm a diminisher. <laughs> yeah, I got a problem. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was, and some of them don't see it as a problem, but you know, and, and I remember one, um, the book had been out for just a week and I had um, spoken on NPR and uh, someone who had heard that went and got the book, read it in like three days, sends an email note and it, all it said was, accidental diminisher seeking reform and reformation. Yeah. Um, and he gave his, his information and as I got talking to him, he was a CEO of a very, um, a large global creative firm who said this is the only way he knew how to lead. All his role models had been diminishers. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so interesting what he said. Um, he was in his 50s. He said, I've got about 10 or 12 years left in my career, mm -hmm. my working career. He said, I'd like to go out as a multiplier. 
and I'd like to build other multipliers in the process. And interestingly, um, we just did an assessment, a 360 assessment for him, well, probably a year and a half later after coaching and just watching him do some amazing work and to see this line move and to see people describe him as just um, a multiplier. Yeah. It was amazing. Your idea of the accidental diminisher was the, was the one concept that concerned me the most. Because <laughs> initially I saw, you know, he's a tyrant. He's, okay, I go, I, okay, That's we, not me. Yeah, we no. all know those people. No. But the accidental diminisher that is a really nice person who makes poor choices that don't bring out the best in people. They don't have, maybe it's the courage to really lead this way. Maybe it's they don't want to create a disruption for someone or challenge, but talk to me about some of the accidental diminishers. How does somebody do this this way? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, being the accidental diminisher is the path of least resistance. It's, it's how we end up unless we set ourselves on a course to be aware. And we find that the accidental diminisher is, it's the good manager. This is the good person with the very best of intentions. In fact, often with noble intentions, they end up having this diminishing um, impact. And let me just offer a few of the ways that I That'd see this. I see it out in the business world. I see it in the nonprofit world. I see it at home. Yeah. I see it in my home. <laughs> <laughs> and and let, me, let me throw a couple of these profiles out. A few of these I have some vulnerabilities with myself. Um, first is the idea guy. This is the person who's creative, innovative. They're just, they're a fountain of ideas. And, you know, heaven forbid they go to a conference and on a run and then take a shower because now they're all full of ideas and they come into the office just bursting with ideas. The intent is that their ideas will stimulate other people's ideas. But what actually happens around an idea guy? In fact, this might be fun if people want to chat this in. You know, what happens when you work for an idea guy? You know, often we find that people spend their time chasing these good ideas, but they get nothing done. They sort of make a millimeter of progress in a hundred different directions. Um, and be, it's because the person always has more and more ideas and you can never execute the ideas? Well, they have an insatiable appetite for new ideas. And so they just, they toss them out, but they go nowhere yeah. because there's too many. Yeah. And so after a while, you just figure out my boss has ideas. And if I don't do anything with it, it disappears and we don't have to worry about this it. This too and, shall pass. Yeah. This yep. too shall pass. I'm a little bit of an idea guy and I've learned that when I have an idea and I'm all excited about telling someone, telling someone on my team, I stop and ask myself, do you want people to stop what they're doing and work on this? Well, if the answer is no, then I just have to hold it. I have yeah. to create like a holding tank, yep. which I hate. <laughs> I'd much rather spout ideas. Um, so that's the idea guy. Um, another way we do this is the leader who's always on. This is the person who's just energetic, passionate. They're always present, always engaged, mm -hmm. always something to say. You know, maybe blessed with the gift of gab. Yep. You know, and they think that their energy is infectious. But what actually happens around uh, someone who's always on, you know, the human who doesn't have an off switch? You know, anyone who wants can chat these in. It'd be fun to see what, what people have to say about that. Yeah, so what does that? I mean, do you just shut down because somebody's talking all the time and you just go, I have no room to talk? What, what happens? Well, it's this very interesting dual reaction is they tend to expand like a gas to yeah. take all the available space, you know, sort of suffocating everyone else. So other people shut down, yeah. but it's more interesting than that. What do we do to people who are always on? Just ignore them. Yeah, yeah we, we don't make eye contact. You know, we tend to turn them off because um, I often hear people say, oh, they're exhausting me. You're killing me with all this energy. You know, and sometimes in this sort of eager, almost this sort of enthusiastic, um, you know, evangelical enthusiasm that we get as yeah. managers, as leaders, it has a way of turning people off. Yeah. And then we are not heard. And we think, wow, but I was so articulate and big and energetic. White noise. <laughs> um, another way we see this happen a lot is what I call the rescuer. And the rescuer is the nice person, the well-intended uh, person. This is the person who does not like to see people struggle, suffer, make mistakes. And so when people are struggling, they simply jump in and they, they help. Yeah, fix it. They fix it. And they yeah. don't even have to have this, well, I'm going to take over and fix it and save the day. I'm just going to help. But what happens if Steve is always helping Liz every time she gets stuck when she encounters an obstacle or a bump in the road? Yep. Well, I think this is the one that church leaders especially can really 
really struggle with, that you think you're doing something with benevolent uh, intentions, but what you're doing, again, is you're diminishing the person because you're not allowing them to fix it themselves. Yeah, you know, when we rescue, we starve people of vital learning. You know, we, st we starve them of the ability they need to be strong and stand on their own and to have independence. Yeah. And so it's not to say that you can't help. Um, you know, uh, one of the multipliers we studied, I thought, had such a great insight on this. He said, Liz, it's irresponsible as a leader not to help when people are struggling. And there are times when you need to stand back, but there are times when you do need to jump in and help. And he said, but you have to give the pen back. Mm -hmm. And what he was referring to is he was referring to a situation where he was working with the team, they were struggling to come up with a storyboard and a presentation for one of their clients. And the team just looked at it, it was 2 a.m help and Jay could see it and he could see the solution. He goes up to the board and you know he's kind of starts to draw it and he lays it out and it's almost sort of intoxicating. He's gonna save the day and the multiplier in him signaled stop. Yeah. And he finished that up and he turned back to the project leader and he said well here's some themes, here's some ideas to get you started and this pen that he had taken from her, she readily gave it to him like please yeah. and he just said here, why don't you take it from there? And he gave the pen back, and he sat down. Of course, the pen signaling accountability. Yeah. You know, so you can jump in and help, but you gotta give the pen back and say, no, no, you're in charge. Yeah. I believe you can do this. And you've gotta back yourself out of it. So that's the rescuer. Oh yeah, yeah that's great. Any others you've got that you would say the accidental? Yeah, a few other ways that we do this. Um, the pace setter. This is a leader who wants to kind of up the standards, um, I talked about like the, the women's minors, like let's just, let me show what this looks like. Let me set the standard for quality, for pace, for energy. I'll set the standard and other people will follow. And what we find is that when the leader gets out ahead, people often don't follow. Hmm. They often slow down or and sometimes they give up. You know, it reminds me, um, I, ha I have four children, but my youngest is, is nine. He's the only one, Steve, that I can still run faster then, yeah. <laughs> and that, it's just barely. And he loves to run to the bus stop, and most days, you know, he wins. I let him win, or it's really close, but every now and then I forget, and I just get going, and I get to the bus hop, stop, I'm like, <sighs> and I turn back and look, and what's he doing? He's giving up. Yeah, he's walking. Yeah. He's not racing, he's walking, and what does he say to me when he gets to the bus stop? It's the same thing, every time I do this, because I have done this more than once. Does he say, I can never beat you? No, he says, I wasn't racing, Mom. Hmm. And it's what happens when leaders get too far out ahead. People just say, I can't win. I can't keep up. I can't even finish, yeah. you know, in the same frame here. So, so I won't even race. I'm not going to race. I'm just going to be a huh. spectator. So it doesn't create followers. It creates spectators no. who just say, hey, look at you go. You must be having fun. Um, also, the rapid responder. This is the person who like clears out their inbox, you know, every 10 minutes. Um, you know, I'm on it. Uh, you know, they, they, they respond quickly to email. Someone comes in their office with a problem. They're pretty quick to resolve that. They move fast. Actually, with the intention of keeping everyone else moving fast. But we find that people don't move fast around them. You know, often they create a traffic jam or people just wait knowing they're going to respond. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, one of my favorites is the optimist. Like, yeah, How so, could that be diminishing? Yeah, what's wrong with this? One? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, for those of us who are kind of optimistic, this one hurts. Is, you know, what happens when the leader has this can-do attitude? You know, we've got this. We can do it. No, you know, no problem. We can do it. How could that be diminishing? Well, in some ways, it sends a message which which says, "This is easy." It undermines their struggle. Um, I learned this one a couple years ago. I was working with a colleague, and, and we were doing some c complicated analysis and research, and at one point in the project, he just stopped me and said, Liz, I need you to stop saying that. Like, I said, what? He goes, you know that thing that you say all the time? I was like, oh, what? He goes, how hard can it be? How hard can it be? How hard can it be? You say it all the time. And I said, well, that's probably because I got these supersized jobs where I had to say to myself, how hard can this be? You know, we can figure this out. We're smart. We're capable. We can do this. And, and I explained this to him, and he goes, that's the thing I need you to stop saying. I said, why? He goes, well, because what we're doing is actually really hard. And I could see that my optimism 
that we could do it was actually undermining the struggle. I've learned to say the thing that we're doing is actually really, really hard. No one's ever done this before, or we're doing it against the odds, but I think we can. And it has a very, very different impact on people. Yeah. But these are just a few of some of the ways with the very best of intentions we can end up shutting people down. Yeah. All right, so let's jump back to the multipliers for just a minute. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that stood out to me was the intense intellectual curiosity of the multiplier. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but they had power, not just in their listening, but in the way they ask questions. Can, can you describe what you found in these multipliers and, and how they utilize their curiosity for this? Yeah, you know, these multipliers, they tend to, they think in questions. You know, diminishers tend to think in terms of answers. Yeah. And multipliers have made this shift, which for many of us is a very, very difficult transition. They've shifted out of the mode of having answer, uh, answers and they start to ask the questions, mm -hmm. the questions that focus thinking, that focus the intelligence of a team on a problem. Yep. They ask the kind of questions that shift the burden of thinking from me as the leader to the team of people around me so that it becomes this shared collective burden and a burden that's really a sweet burden that we want to assume. And um, it's a tough shift. It's a really, really tough shift. How come? Why, why is it difficult? Well, because we're, we're taught from our childhood to have all the answers. and. Um, I'll share with you one of the ways that we can can make that shift. I call it the extreme question mm -hmm. challenge. I don't know if you have taken the extreme question challenge, Steve. If not, I'm going to ask you You're to try it. You're going to ask me to. All right, great. So I have I, not done it yet, so okay, I'm so being honest. I did, not, I did not invent the extreme question okay. challenge. I was a victim of, of, of it the first time, and you know, this is about a dozen years ago. I have three small children. I also have a big job at work, and I'm just I'm talking to... Uh, a colleague at work, you know, he's sympathetic. He's got two small um, daughters as well. And I'm just telling him, Brian, you know, I feel like I've become kind of a bossy mom. I'm constantly telling my kids what to do. I'm barking orders. And he said, oh, Liz, not you. How could you be a bossy mom? You know, wink, wink. And and I described bedtime for him. And you've, you've got young children. They're not little, yeah. but yeah, what's bedtime typically like? It's a little bit chaotic. A little yeah. bit chaotic. <laughs> and, and for me, he was six, four, and two years old. Mm -hmm. It was constantly, you know, we'd get to bedtime. I'm like, okay, come on, time for bed. Put that away. Leave her alone. Put those back. Come over here. Get your pajamas on. Go brush your teeth. No, no, do it again. Use toothpaste this time. Um, get a book, you know. No, no, not the big book. Give me a little book, you know. Okay, a little book. And then, okay, bed, story time, story time and it's like come on prayer come, over here for, come on kids time to pray time to pray yeah. come on make them sincere um yeah. and then let's go to, you know get into bed you know down in my bed into your bed and it was constant it wasn't yelling yeah it was telling it was directional yeah it was very directional and brian said liz i want you to go home tonight and try something you know why don't you go home tonight and try talking to your children only in the form of questions no statements yeah. you know i put up a fight at first thinking oh that's not possible but it was yeah and dinner was interesting, and playtime was interesting. We get to bedtime, I simply look at my watch. It's like, well, kids, what time is it? It's bedtime. Well, what do we do at bedtime? What needs to be done? And the toys get put away. I said, okay, what do we do after our toys are put away? Well, we put our pajamas on. Who needs help? And then I say, what comes after uh, pajamas? We brush our teeth. Who's gonna be first? What story are we gonna read tonight? Who's gonna you know, pick the story? And then the story gets picked. Who's gonna read the story? And they picked my husband to read the story, <laughs> which worked out nicely. And, and then what do we do next? Well, mom, we pray. Hmm. And then I said, who's ready for bed? And they went and they got in their beds and they stayed in their beds and I'm standing there you know, in the hallway alone and in shock thinking, what has happened to my children? You know, like, I swear, they didn't know how to do this last night. How They couldn't have. That's why I had to tell them. But yet, somehow, tonight, they know how to do that. I kept this up for three nights, just asking questions. And I found out my children knew how to do that. They knew how to get themselves to bed. They knew how to get themselves ready for school. They knew how to do a lot of things that I had been doing for them. Hmm. And I think it was about night three, as I was realizing it had a profound I mean, truly profound impact on me as a parent. And I thought, I wonder if the people who work on my management team are a whole lot smarter. And maybe they don't need me telling them what to do. And so it helped me shift out of this mode of giving answers and 
telling people and shift into the mode of the multiplier, which is to ask the questions that shift burden, accountability. Responsibility, yeah. And responsibility onto others. And yep. that's the extreme question challenge. And Steve, I'm, I'm going to ask you to take it. I will do that tonight. Is that what you're saying? Tonight with my kids, try to get Anywhere. them to bed without a... I mean, you can take it. You can lead um, a staff meeting this way. Mm -hmm. You can lead a one-on-one -on -one this way. You can lead yeah. sort of a, um, a conversation, a spiritual conversation this way. You can lead a business review yeah. Yeah. this way. And I, I guess my, my challenge to those who will take it is, I'm not suggesting you stay in this mode all the time because you know it's a little bit creepy. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> if, you, if you operate this way entirely, but just once, 100% all the way, yeah. and something shifts. Yeah, even just to try your next meeting with somebody, and uh, I think it's a great challenge to see, could you get through a one hour meeting with someone without making a statement that every sentence you say ends with a question mark? I think that's a fantastic challenge. And again, what, the impact you saw on your kids, I think you'll see in organizations as well, that you realize that they're smarter than they think they are, they're stronger, they can make great decisions. Right. And you can also use it to interrogate people and have a very diminishing effect. Yeah. So I, I, I challenge people to approach it with intellectual curiosity, really yeah. hungry to know what other people know. Yeah. And you'll be blown away. Yeah. All right, I want to turn, our audience has begun asking questions. And I want to take the last minutes we have here to answer some of those. So first question, uh, how do you tell a diminisher boss that he or she is a diminisher? <laughs> Go ahead with that one, yeah. You know, we, we get this question a lot, and I think when, when I have seen people make profound, real change to become a multiplier, it comes from within. And I don't think you can, um, a lot of people want to poof their boss into being a multiplier, or they want me to do it. Um, I've seen people give their boss the book. I've actually had a group say, Liz, can you come talk to our boss? But you know, he, he walked away saying, I love your book, Liz, I am such a multiplier. <laughs> like you wrote about me. And his team is thinking, no, you actually, she wrote about you, it's the other side. Yeah. And our tendency, um, I mean, I think we can tell people that, you know what, hey, I'm capable. I think part of, um, when you work for a diminisher, I think one of the things that you need to do is remind them that, you know what, you're smart and you're capable. Like, I've got this. Like, I know when I've had bosses who've tried to micromanage, I say, you know what? Is this what you want to have happen? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, you know what? I'll give that to you. But you can back off. You can give me some space. So I have, I have just reminded them that, you know what? I'm going to get this done for you. And truly, the micromanagers need this. Yeah. Um, you know, or you can do like one, one person did to me. Uh, Carla, she worked for me. She was in my office telling me we couldn't run this class because we didn't have enough server space and this and this and this. So I pick up the phone and I'm calling the data center because I'm going to solve this problem for her. And do you know what Carla did? She said, Liz, stop. She says, you can put that phone down. I'm like, what? I'm trying to help you. I know the guy's in the data center. And she said, no, I don't want you to solve the problem. I just want you to know what I'm dealing with. I learned an important lesson. You yeah. know, I was diminishing. I put yeah. that phone down. And so you can gently tell people, you know what, I don't need to be rescued. Um, or do you know what? Hey, if you give me 24 hours, I will respond to all of these emails. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I need you to give me an hour for some, give me 10 minutes. Right. right. So that's the gentle way to just remind people that you are capable. Yep. All right, next question. Uh, are there correlations between organizations that have rigid hierarchies and the number of diminishers in the organization? You know, absolutely. We find that hierarchical organizations breed diminishers. Mm -hmm. And when we've done this research in parts of the world, in national cultures that are really hierarchical, um, you know, the Middle East, the, uh, the military, uh, Latin America, parts of Asia, where they're just hierarchy is a value in the yep. culture, we find that this diminishing impact is actually greater. Yep. Um, we even talked about org charts, that when you looked at multipliers, they kind of went against the org chart, right? And they looked, it didn't matter where they managed or where they fell in the org chart, they were looking at the whole organization for opportunities. And so they went against the hierarchy in a real sense. And, and they really do. And one of the things, you don't need a non-hierarchical, you don't need a multiplier culture to operate as a multiplier. In fact, most of the multipliers that we studied in the research were people who worked 
in sharp hierarchies, you know, and who often worked for diminishers and in very diminishing environments, they just chose a different way of leading. And in some ways, they're blind to the hierarchy. Kind of the, the mindset of the, the talent magnet, the multiplier's talent magnet is, if I can figure out your genius, you know, if I can figure out your genius and I can figure out Lori's genius, you don't need to report to me. You don't need to be a box on my org chart. That's irrelevant. I'm going to put you to work. Yeah. Everyone in this organization works for me. You know, everyone works for a multiplier. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I loved the idea and that, that concept that, that they weren't just saying, here are the four who report to me. They're saying, I'm going to get to know the genius of everyone, knowing that it'll help me solve problems down the road. Yeah, so. and it's not just altruistic of I'm going to appreciate people's genius. It's, and I'm going to put it to work. Yeah. All right, so next question. Uh, how can mid-level lower level or associates be multipliers? So if you're not managing someone directly potentially, how do you become a multiplier? Well, I actually think in some ways it's the easiest way to be a multiplier, and I don't want to discount um, that it might be hard, but I, like, personally, I find I'm at my best when people don't work for me. Yeah. Because when people work for you and you're senior, you start to believe this myth that somehow you're supposed to provide answers and that there's this command and control line and that people do crazy things because they work for you. Actually, if you don't have people reporting to you, you know, if you're working in a volunteer group, um, you know, a, a committee in mm -hmm. a church, um, it's actually the best place to really practice being a multiplier because it's leading through influence. Mm -hmm. um, Makes a lot of sense. You can yeah. be a multiplier to your boss. Okay, so tell me about that. How can I become a multiplier to my boss? You know, a particular, and let me take the scenario where your boss is a diminisher because yeah. that's really the extreme case. Um, you know, we often think that we are entitled to a certain kind of leadership. And, right. you know, in my ideal world, everyone gets, that, receives that kind of leadership. But in reality, most don't. And we look at our bosses and we say, okay, you're supposed to be a multiplier to me. But what if you become a multiplier to your boss? Particularly if your boss is a diminisher. They're smart. They, and, you know, what does a diminisher want? They want to be smart. They want to be recognized for their intelligence. Hmm. And often when people are diminishers, we look at that and we, we kind of cast judgment on it. And we say, that's wrong. So I'm going to back away from you. I'm going to not listen to you. I'm going to discount. And in fact, if I'm a mid-level manager, I might actually protect my people from you. Right. Whereas a far, and what it does is it just exacerbates the diminishing effect, right? Hmm. As people don't feel valued, because right. the bosses are just employees too. You know, they want to be valued. And so what I find works a lot better is when the employee operates as a multiplier. They identify their boss's genius and they use it um, yeah. at its fullest. Yep. One of my favorite examples of this, I'll share quickly, came from Apple and um, Ron Johnson, who's now at JCPenney, but he was working for Steve Jobs. And you know, S Steve's known for being a pretty tough, demanding, yep. Yep. Um, person could be very intimidating to go and present your work and your ideas to him. And Ron ran Apple's retail stores. Um, just this brilliant retail genius. What he would do, I asked him, you know, how do you, how do you work with Steve? How do you present your work to Steve? And he said, well, my team and I will do our very best work. And then I take it to Steve. Now see, Ron knew Steve's genius. And there's been a lot written about mm -hmm. Steve and his genius, one of which was he knew how to make things better. So Ron would take this and he would give it to Steve and he would ask a single question. You can imagine what that question is. How would you make this better? And so Steve would take their work and he would add, well, what if we put, you know, lights here and what if the stairs were out of glass? And Ron walks out of there with his work even better, fully utilizing the genius and talent of his boss. Who doesn't want to work in that way? Hmm. You know, brilliant work, even more brilliant. All right, next question, uh, and this goes back to some of Marcus Buckingham's work, but how do you see your research with Diminishing Multiplier uh, connecting to Strengths Finder and some of Marcus's work? Have you seen any connections there? Absolutely, and I think a number of people see these connections because one of the things that multipliers do is they deeply appreciate genius in others. You know, they're, they're constantly building, and it's a lot easier to build on strengths than to shore up and fix weaknesses. Um, I use the term native genius, yep. and it's not to be different than, you know, a strength, but it's this idea that it's not even a learned strength, it's something that is native yeah. 
in you. Um, yeah. and An ability I think, that resides there. I think the ideas are very compatible. I've, um, I've used StrengthsFinder myself. I think Marcus's work and it is phenomenal. But part of the power, if you want to become a multiplier, is utilize that to help understand the skills and the strengths and the intelligence of the people that you are working with and utilize that as a tool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, one of the things I've seen teams do, it's a very, very simple exercise you can do. Um, actually, someone read the book, uh, someone in Australia, he said, Liz, we did it, this genius watching thing, just exactly like you laid out in the book. And I thought, oh, really? And he explains it to me. It was nothing like I had laid out mm -hmm. in the book, and it was so much better. Mm -hmm. What they did is they took the management team of their small company, so this is like a team of, of 10 people, and everyone took a turn sharing what they thought the genius, mm -hmm. the native genius, the thing people do freely and easily, of each one of the team. So if it was Steve's turn, everyone says, Steve, this is what I see as your genius, you know? You synthesize ideas, someone else, and soon you have a 360 degree view of your genius, and then the team talks about how do we use it at its fullest. Yeah, yeah so many 360s are about what you're not good at. It'd be great to have one that's, here's what we see as being a skill above and beyond your job. All right, next question. How do you see these kinds of skills changing an organization or a business? Like, what do you see the transformation in the business happening when people apply this? Well, I'll give you a, a real practical one that's sort of hot off um, our measurement is uh, a, a manager in a business. Um, Rajani Ramanathan, she's the COO of Salesforce.com. She did some multipliers training for her team, and then she, she played the role of a challenger and said, let's measure how well we're utilizing our team, and let's take it to the next level. They measured it, we have a little tool for doing that, and came out at 70%. She said, you know, what do we need to do to get this 10% more? Not with the sense of like, how do we squeeze work out of people, but how do we create this kind of environment? Yeah. Um, a year later, we remeasured, and it was 78%. Mm. So, you know, they had hit that 10%, which is great, but then Rajani and I did some quick calculations, and we saw that 8% increase, it equated to the equivalent of 25 new heads in her organization. Hmm. You know, that's how that's much amazing, additional yeah. capability that she's getting. So, you know, really the, uh, the promise of the multiplier essentially is you could take people who have been diminished and you can double your, yeah. your brain force, your workforce. You could double your volunteer yeah. crew. You know, if you've got 20 people on your team, how about 40? And I think that's really what we see. We see organizations um, really shifting their entire culture yeah. around the ideas. Yeah, well, that's where you go. I mean, I felt this way when you and I talked and then when I read the book as well, that I feel accountable for the organization I lead to get maximum impact from their gifts and abilities. Mm. And it's one of the things that keeps me up is, what am I, what am I missing? Not just from the staff, but from volunteers. And uh, this is one where I, some of the skills here I go hopefully can help unlock it. And I think that's when you'll be able to see the real potential that's been sitting latent this whole time. And again, that's the concern I have is maybe there's far more we could be seeing from these people if only I managed and led and our team led better. So. Well, and I think there is, anytime you're exposed to a set of ideas that reveal a gap, you know, sometimes our inclination is to say, oh, I need to transform what I'm doing. I need to do something entirely different. I need to figure out how to get 100%. Hmm. And you can end up having kind of a strange personality um, alteration <laughs> yeah. that, that you know, honestly, it's just creepy. You yeah. know, it kind of freaks people out around you. And what I find is the leaders who are the most successful are, in many ways, the least ambitious. Hmm. They're purposely unambitious. They, they take just one thing. Hmm. And that's what I would encourage people to do, whether you've read the book, whether you've listen to the broadcast, is just what's one thing that you can do differently? Maybe yeah. you identify genius of people on your team. Maybe you take this extreme question challenge. Yep. That's a maybe for everyone, but a real hopefully for you. One thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, maybe you supersize someone's job. And just, mm -hmm. you know, experiment on the idea. You know, plant a seed and see if it grows. Yeah. Because, you know, let go of the big long list of everything you want to do. I, I got a, an email from a CEO down in Guatemala that said he had filled his entire office, all of his walls were full mm. of the things he was going to do as a multiplier. And I think it's better to just pick one because yeah. once you do that one, you'll see the impact, you'll get this positive reception, and you'll know the next thing to do. Yeah. All right, it's a nice transition to the last question. 
And uh, one person here identified and said, is there a solution for each category of the accidental diminishers? I've diagnosed several <laughs> symptoms of all of them in my leadership. <laughs> would you, what advice would you give to that person that says, I'm becoming an accidental diminisher? You know, we, we do have a set of challenges. Um, we've got some of them out on our website, and I think um, Willow Creek Association is putting one of them they out are. there. That's correct. And, you know, if you don't find them on our website, tweet me. I'm at Liz Wiseman. And I will make sure you get pointed to a remedy for that. You know, my heart goes out to anyone who wants to remedy any of the accidental diminishing. I'll, I'll make sure to, to offer a suggestion to you. That's fantastic. Liz, it's been a great conversation. And uh, you and I, when we talked about this, uh, I went through the book and understood the categories could describe them to you. But in our conversation, what hit me was the minute I realized even accidentally what I and others may be doing is diminishing the life and the impact and the intelligence of someone. And that word diminishing just really stood out to me. And uh, so thank you for the choice of words you've made that really challenge us as leaders to give our very best to our people. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I think the idea behind multipliers is you allow people to grow their talent. And we know that this is part of our role here on this earth is to find our talents, share them with others, and grow them. Yeah. That's our accountability, and I yeah. think that's what often gets diminished and what multipliers do. So, Steve, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. Thanks for joining us for it. I want to just give you a couple uh, updates, a couple announcements about what's going on moving forward. First off, if you want to learn more about this, I highly encourage that you read Liz's book, Multipliers. It's a great read. And uh, I encourage you to actually take your team. My team's going to go through this. We're going to read this together and talk through how we can become better at this. As well, Liz mentioned that on the WCA blog, there's going to be a couple resources that Liz is going to put up there. As well, she's agreed to put a couple blog posts this week. So be checking it this week. A couple just easy next steps to grow in this. And then uh, our next uh, conversation on the webcast is going to be Wednesday, October 17th, 11.30 Central Time. And our guest is going to be Mark Miller. Mark's the Vice President uh, of Training and Development at Chick-fil-A. And I know you're going to be blessed by the conversation with him. Thanks for being with us today.